You're very welcome to the Confident Women Islands YouTube channel with me, Roisin de Cleric. Confident Women Islands YouTube channel is all about supporting women, discussing issues and topics and life situations that women encounter every day. We are about promoting and highlighting women doing extraordinary things within our communities locally, nationally and internationally. Here in Ireland, just like the rest of the world, gender ideology, recognition, self-ID has become a widespread topic, an issue for women and children. From our female spaces to women in sport, our healthcare, and importantly, our children's education. I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Louis, uh, Lisha de Vuren, founder, founder and CEO of The Countess, who are a voluntary and non-partisan human rights advocacy group with members from all corners of Ireland and beyond, who provide resources, toolkits, and templates to help take actions about issues that you care about. The Countess organization empowers people of Ireland to discuss how the Gender Recognition Act impacts everyday life. The Countess says we have to have grown up conversations about the influence of gender identity, politics on a practical and policy. The Countess centers on women and children in all that they do. Louise Debron, Lisha Debron, sorry, Lisha Debron is the founder and CEO of The Countess, is a broadcaster, lactate, lactation consultant and barrister. Louise Debron, you're very, very welcome to Confident Women Islands YouTube channel. It's great to be here. Lovely to chat to you, Roisin. Uh, Lisha, sorry for mispronouncing your name. Mm -hmm. Lisha, I found you on Twitter and I was following The, uh, the Countess and uh, before I even realized, you know, the inspirational woman behind the uh, the Countess, but you are the founder and the CEO of the Countess. You're a barrister, as I said in my intro, and you're also a broadcaster. And did I uh, get that right? You're a lactation consultant as well. Yeah, I'm a IBCLC, so uh, an International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. Um, and I currently work in private practice in Dublin. In Dublin. So tell us, what inspired you and motivated you to set up the Countess organisation? Um, I would say first and foremost, it was a sense that as I realised quite how bad things were, then there was this sort of secondary um, realisation that actually nobody was doing anything about it. Um, and I think that's what happens to uh, those women and men who kind of take up the mantle and, you know, step up and put their head above the parapet and organize in this space. I think there's a commonality there where there's a there's almost like a few different steps to this. So initially you think, oh, something's not quite right here. And, you know, and I was for a good while there, I was kind of going along with the orthodoxy, with the official narrative, which after all tells us this is just like gay rights. It's the next level, the next step, the natural progression of gay rights. And because naturally I was completely behind that, I yeah. just went along with it. But I do remember having this kind of vague little, I would call it like white noise, you know, um, misgivings or things that weren't making sense or I was slightly uncomfortable with. But it's really hard to get that information like it's, you know, where it's it is an ideology and we're being surrounded by it. And it's kind of been pumped out through um, Hollywood, through uh, mainstream media, legacy media, through um, via NGOs, via our politicians. So it's like it's all around us. I mean, it's the yeah. sea we swim in, really. It is the sea we swim in. And so, you know, I'm really grateful that I had a kind of trigger event. So I was watching. Um, Gay Pride in London in 2018, and there was a group of lesbians who did a protest. And that was interesting because they did a very Gandhi-esque action. They lay down, they stopped the Pride March moving on. Um, but it really triggered this whole thing for me and what kind of spiked my curiosity um, was the fallout and the kind of framing of it. So 
the then mayor of London said there's no room for hate in London Pride. And I remember thinking, wait now, what they did was completely peaceful. That's not hate. And then I also was really struck by the juxtaposition of these elderly women in the denim jackets and grey hair who obviously had been at the, you know, uh, in the trenches for many years as social justice warriors. They just looked like that kind of pedigree. And that juxtaposed, juxtaposed with kind of a sea of hedonistic young men and then behind them all the kind of corporate sponsors from Goldman Sachs to like, you know, all the big corporates. And I just thought, whoa, wait a minute, something. Why? And also as a journalist, I, I just wondered why was nobody asking why? Why did no one be the women and say, why are you protesting? Why did nobody bother to interrogate that? It was just this kind of very lazy intellectually and journalistically approach, which said, you know, they are wrong. Pride is good. There's nothing to see here. There's nothing wrong with any of this. And what the women were saying, the lesbians, was um, the cotton ceiling is rape culture. So I probably, my entry point was probably the most unbelievable, um, you know, kind of far out, like almost like you wouldn't believe it if you didn't know it was true, um, part of only one pillar if you like um that's impacted by every day so the pillar would be lesbian erasure we've had a lesbian erasure um pillar of concern we have a working group full of lesbians who live in london in dublin rather or sorry around the country um in ireland but the point being that these lesbians were saying that there are men who say they are women not only but also lesbians and they're putting pressure on lesbians to accept them as sexual partners and this is rape culture this is no different wow. to you know you need a good seeing to love or you just haven't found the right man love that they would have lived through in the 60s 70s 80s and now to see their younger sisters you know having to deal with this it's quite visceral so that was actually my entry point because then i had to start looking and looking and, and and reading and I and I consciously joined Twitter. I followed all the thought leaders. The movement was very much um more nascent then, but still very, very robust, particularly in the UK. And I always thank my, you know, UK fellow activists for that incredible um theoretical framework really that they first hypothesized, which was which is the basis for the resistance, you know, globally, really. Um predicated on you know the need for single sex provision and just um a good robust understanding of why we need our single sex spaces so then i um read and read and read and like and this wouldn't be unique to me you know you when you join the dots it's existential you you grasp the existential threat to women and children yeah and then i kind of came up for air and i was like oh i have to tell everyone this is extraordinary like it's everywhere the reach of this is, is just unbelievable but uh you know, it's a hard lesson, like not everyone wants to hear, the culture doesn't want to hear. So I just very quickly, I started to talk about it in real life. And I was at a dinner in Dublin and everyone just went like this, like silence. So I, I something just triggered me from that point on. I'm going to I'm going to start organizing. And it's funny, I remember from Barack Obama's um, autobiography that he was an organizer. And I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. Like I had literally no background in activism. And I just knew that he was an organizer for communities, you know, in I think I don't know where it was, uh, where he was, where he grew up, um, and then I think laterally in Washington in D.C. But I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to gather people around me and decide on our aims and objectives and just try and do something. Mm -hmm. And and then we started scoping. We scoped really hard for a good six months secretly on Zoom, and I think that has really um, served us well because we were very clear on who we are, what we want, how we're going to approach this um you know what even what our red lines are what we will discuss what we won't even our language policy like mm -hmm. are we going to say trans women are we going to say trans identified males like how are we going to approach this so we've had a very thoughtful approach from the start and a very kind of robust um you know intellectual approach and it's been very careful and disciplined online and like i'm happy to say because of that policymakers are now working with us you know across a few different areas of this and like that doesn't happen magically you have to earn their trust I think is how I'd put it and so from that you know with your journalistic background and where you know how to get that as you said the language right how to tell that story and then with the legal background I've been a lawyer and a barrister that you can actually really match that for legislation and for getting people to listen to you and know that 
as you said, that trust, because no matter what, it, we need to actually have the legislation right. And, yeah, I you know, agree. That's and, like that's not for everyone. And, you know, and I think there's space for everyone. There's room for everyone in this kind of uncontested space. You know, like I never, ever sort of put down anyone else's approach to this because I think I think when you're giving up your time and you're giving up your spare time and you're unpaid and you're doing your brain work and you're managing people and managing people is not easy <laughs> managing activists is not easy because everyone's in this from a very very emotive passionate passionate point of view so it's not like a work normal work day yeah. um and so if you're doing all that you have to do it in a way that works for you and I, in my way has been um you know, I've it's I've said it from the beginning. It's been on our website from the beginning. We're going to amend the GRA, yes. um, meaning that we'll chip away at it until it actually can do no damage. Now, obviously, as a woman, as a mother of three children, I I don't think a man can get a piece of paper and that makes him a woman. No. Of course not. But I would rather deal with the actual real physical threat of rape and of harassment, and of a breach of dignity and privacy to women and girls in the here and now, which is doable and feasible, I think, which we can get support of versus the kind of wider ontological threat to what it means to be a woman on paper. And also legally, you know, there are, there are cases there in Europe, like the UK and Goodwin case, which, you know, the law can't go back before, it can't go beyond that. So I think, you know, for now, at least, we need to have some form of self-ID because that has been tested in Europe and it has been legislated for I just feel for me and I also think there's an elegance to amending the GRA because if you look at the debates in the Dáil at the time what we did have consensus for and what was debated and in fact what was um, originally recommended by the uh, joint um, committee on um, self ID, it was a joint Oireachtas advisory committee, and you know, so initially we did this all the right way, like we had the best experts uh, look at this, and they actually they what they did, they produced um, guidance or advice, and what they wanted was the medical model. So I think we need to amend what we have back to the medical model, and of course that's still ontologically um, incredibly insulting and annoying to women, yeah. but at least it at least there's gatekeeping, you know, and I think. For me, like I've always had a really hard line around and a red line around single sex spaces. You know, I don't believe any man, no matter how he identifies, should be able to use my daughter's changing room or toilet. And that's just and and you know, and this space has often had men and women who will be given a platform in the mainstream media, largely because they don't really say that. They'll say things like, Well, maybe some people some women might need them, but I don't, or, you know, it's very wishy-washy. And I don't think that's helpful because it makes us look like extremists. And in fact, we're actually the ones reflecting the view of the nine out of 10 people in Ireland. Yeah. And two, when you think the Gender uh, Recognition Act in 2015, it's just so sort of like sneaked in very quietly because an awful lot of people, even politicians said, they didn't know what they were actually even legislating or bringing in at the time. It was very ambiguous. But, you know, what is, from your perspective, what is, what is the uh, Gender Recognition Act of 2015, what does it speci specify about gender identity here in Ireland? So basically, um, like, it's quite an extraordinary piece of yeah. legislation. So, um, as someone said, Lucy Hunt, who I've worked with, she's a um, campaigner based in Scotland. And I was at a, a briefing with her in the House of Lords and we both spoke, but she said at the time, I've never forgotten this. Like, if you're gay or lesbian or bisexual, you don't get a piece of paper from the government. No. As you hear. <laughs> so, and so really, if we take a step back, like, what is this about? It's like a laying of the hands from the state on a person. Um, firstly, secondly, like, does it even do what it's meant to do? Because actually, will it even get you into those spaces if that's what you want? Like the law with regard to how it um, interacts with, say, the gender ground inequality legislation is completely unclear. Now, in Ireland, like in England in the past, we have our various august bodies and institutions who are supposed to interpret EU 
and, and human rights law for you know NGOs and for politicians and for the public, but they're interpreting it as if they wish as they wish it would be, not how it is. So like currently, you there is a right in law to have single sex intimate spaces and sports as well that they are protected now. So there's a real conflict there. So like like clearly you and I and everyone else really deep down, we all know that a piece of paper, even if you're given it by the government, it's not going to change your sex. Like every cell of your body is either male or female. Now, if there are men who want to put on dresses and makeup and present as women, like when we ran a poll two years ago, two years ago, two and a half years ago, that's what it showed. And I was heartened by that. You know, people in Ireland are very tolerant to, to um, you know, that live and that live thing. But, and that's great. Like, but what we don't want is then that those rights, you know, basically hamper or um, erode the rights that are there that belong to women and children. And I think... You know, previously that was not really grappled with. It wasn't really discussed. And like to your point about, you know, politi- politicians didn't even know. Like they weren't supposed to know. We were none of us were meant to be debating it properly. Like no one was meant to go up and go. Wait a minute, how will this impact women and women yeah. and women as well? Um. So I think that was certainly uh, intentional for sure. Um. And like, you know, we are where we are and all we can do is try and roll it backwards now. Um, mm-hmm. But we're at a really interesting like moment, I think, because like we do info stalls all around the country and people are so kind of grateful to hear from us. Thank you. Keep going. You know, I'm really worried about this or that or, you know, people have different uh, areas that kind of exercise them. And because we cover everything, you know, we're we're covering the transitioning of young people, medical transition, lesbian erasure, sports, prisons, you know, single sex provision, like the whole thing we cover, language, legislation. So, and we've got a lot of useful um, toolkits and resources for people and template letters. So like they just kind of, there's this sense that there's a hunger for the debate and for the discourse. Yeah. And we provide this framework which makes people feel safe. And increasingly, I think it feels safe for legislators, for policymakers. And that's, you know, that was kind of our core goal, really. But now we have to work legislatively to roll back the GRA, because I think when we started working in this area, like it felt very abstract to people. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, okay, it's coming to your home and it, you know, and it will... The thing about this ideology is like it'll, you know, it it, it impacts the most vulnerable the most, I feel. Mm. Whether that's a woman in a homeless shelter in Rat Mines, whether it's a woman in the Doka Centre uh, in Mount Joy or the Women's Wing in Limerick, that's who it impacts. And then as well as those women who've had really hard lives and are high, highly vulnerable, you're talking about the, the child who's going through a traumatic or has had a traumatic event in their life, like child sexual abuse or a really bad breakup that wasn't handled well by her the parents or an eating disorder or, you know, a whole litany of comorbidities around their mental health, who's just highly, highly distressed and in a lot of pain. And it also comes for those girls, typically young, you know, young girls. And I think that's my big issue with it. It's just, you know, it's not it's not a positive force in society. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly damaging. It's destabilizing and it chews up and spits out those two cohorts. And I will not have that happen. I will use every single bit of energy I have and brain power I have to do my best to stop it, to stop it going further. No, you say, you know, we, we are where we are and we all agree we are where we are, even if it is like something out of a Hollywood movie script. Yeah. Right? yeah. But where did this all begin? Because I've been trying to think where did yeah. all so the Gender Recognition Act was passed in 2015. So this is 2023. Yeah. Now, I was actually thinking, you know, and going back and going backwards with the dots. Yeah. You know, 
it was slowly, slowly drip fed in to normalize all where we are now. But where did this gender recognition all come from? Where did this transgender ideology come from, from your perspective and your opinion? You see, you're always asked that. And like on one hand, yes, I can give you the names of three Bond yeah. Yeah, you can. villains. But I think that is too simplistic. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's always going to be bad actors in any nefarious ideology or like, let's say industrial military complex or, you know, uh, big pharma industrial complex. There's always going to be people who are trying to make a profit. Like I think yeah. that's a given. I don't think that's kind of, um, you know, uh, anything new. But I also think it's symptomatic of some people would argue it's the end of Western civilization. You know, we're now kind of eating ourselves. These are luxury <laughs> beliefs and we've nowhere else to go. So um, maybe that's true. Possibly. Like, I do think that it's no coincidence that, you know, trans ideology and indeed critical race theory have really taken hold amongst the very upper echelons of affluent kind of millennial you know, young people who have very little else to worry about, you know, and it, it is surprising to me. And I think it is of interest that these really hard left radical theories, including, you know, um, and not limited to, you know, gender identity theory, but also queer theory um, and uh, critical race theory, you know, like I'm of an age where we would have looked at these, but they were kind of like, instructive so it was a device to critique what was there already but now it's like the generation after me in the social sciences have just ran with this like now it is the it's it's not only is it the more it's mainstreamed but it's also the only doctrine the only dogma you know it's not used the way it was intended so like a good example would be this whole thing of like white women tears and you know, weaponizing um, intersectionality, you know, so essentially splitting the sex class that is women up, which is what has always happened to us. You know, there's always been these wedge issues that they've tried to divide us with. So I just see this in the same manner. But when I was taught intersectionality uh, as part of my, I did it as part of like comparative. So so like uh, one of my electives in Trinity would have been comparative law. And one of that, the part of that curriculum I think was feminism and then a tiny part of that was intersectionality and the way it was taught was you know there is like this first wave and the second wave and then there's an increasing awareness that black women have added extra structural inequalities which they live with by virtue of the fact of their race so there's misogyny but there's also racism and these two kind of things intertwine and it's a very specific subjective experience to these black women so so that so therefore in terms of consciousness raising, it's really important to remember that because not everything that will impact an affluent white woman will be the same lived experience as a black woman in a ghetto or or a, in a boardroom or whatever. You know, it's just it's just it was just that kind of um very nuanced uh, intersection between race and sex and the the two axes of oppression. But now the way that's taught is, or the way it's been weaponized is, you know, these white women like they're all Karens and all they we just want to be like we just want to we and all these Karens keep stopping us because they're like you know a nightmare and they are and you hear this kind of white women tears like we just cry crocodile tears if we feel afraid or we feel someone's in our space or we feel physically uh, threatened and so I think this is a classic wedge um tool like the way prostitution was used or um pornography you know like if you're one of the cool girls you're going to think pornography is great or lap dancing is empowering or sex work is work they're all wedge issues and now trans women or women is the next wedge issue so if you're like a lefty and you're progressive and you're one of the cool girls you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna think feminism is for everyone and that's what i've heard from younger women and you know i find that extraordinary because feminism is yeah. not when feminism the basis of feminism is to free women womankind from oppression and what is the yeah. basis of oppression it is the reproductive burden it's male violence it's you know um inequality misogyny all of these structural constraints that we live with yes and it's funny the thing with the the trans agenda like i feel like 
for so many women, I don't know if you remember everyday sexism, it kind of predated um, the Me Too movement, but it was the English yes. movement and it was very powerful. Yeah. And I think a lot of us, you know, read that website and then read the book and thought, gosh, that wasn't just a dodgy experience. That was actually this or this, you know, it kind of reframed things for a lot of us. And I just think generally our generation of women, you know, we've just got on with it. Like it's the classic thing. We've walked home with a key in our hand. We've texted our friend, tell me you when you've got home, you know, we've been out for a jog and suddenly there's a man there and we've kind of felt our whole body freeze in the way it just does simply does not when a woman comes. And I don't care who says the opposite. That is just a primal reaction when suddenly, you know, you're say running through a forest and there's a man there. And like, firstly, it's really disingenuous to say that that's not the case. And it is the case because, you know, obviously not all men, of course, pose a threat to us, but men generally, you know, do in terms of there's only two sexes and one sex is the one that rapes and murders and assaults and harasses the other and traffics the other. So um, I'm trying to remember where I was going with this. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I feel like our generation, like we've put up with so much, you know, yeah. we've made great leaps and bounds into the workplace and into and and you know towards equality, but our actual vulnerabilities and also our gifts to the world, the fact that we birth yeah. humanity, yeah, that's all kind of been almost small sized. We've just got on with it, got on with it, got on with it. And now the fact that a man can put on a dress and say, I'm a woman and yeah. I should be on that board. I should take the place of a woman on that board. Or, you know, I remember doing this very angry piece to camera outside the door last year on International Women's Day. And like this well-known um, violence inciting activist for uh, Tenny, who has called for, you know, harm against women, physical harm against women, who is really an agent of incitement of hatred against women. And, you know, he was platformed as a woman. <laughs> and I just thought, God, God's sake, like when, when do we say enough? So I do think there's a, we've reached a tipping point. I think enough women in Ireland are saying, no, like we've actually put up with a lot here. And of course, as women, as Irish women, as Irish women, we have so much in our lineage, you know, epigenetically, I'm sure, I'm sure we carry all that trauma from the mother baby homes and yeah. everything else that's happened to us because we were Irish women. And women were black, uh, were sort of, we were whitewashed out of the photographs of the, you know, the 1916 and 1921, we were just airbrushed out of them. And then women, you had the marriage bar, you had the mother and baby homes and the Madeline sisters, we had the cervical check, you know, the, it just seems to be a constant sort of, issues around women here in Ireland, especially since the foundation of the state. And sometimes I think feminism has changed. You know, if we were talking about feminism to me was again, like the suffragettes, like we, you were saying, equality, equal pay, you know, and be, being able to have that equality to vote or speak up. But then I noticed that, you know, when I was on the radio, I was interviewing everybody and I noticed, I thought, I was very sort of concerned when I was inter interviewing around the, the, the Me Too movement. I thought, well, something here is not adding up for me. You know, yeah. it seems to be coming from Hollywood. It seems to be manufactured. And I just found that this new wave of, for me, my opinion is, this new wave of feminism is manufactured. And it's there's something not right and it's manufactured. And to me, it's a different kind of feminism from what... I grew up with, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, we had lots of um, local women who were like really role models within our community. And then that seemed to be diminishing and where role models were uh, reality television stars. Yeah. They were, they were all, uh, they were singers, they were, they were Hollywood actors or they were influencers yeah. and for celebrities just being known as a celebrity for not doing anything and I noticed that change that there was no core message yeah. for the younger generation that would inspire them or give them look up to them with respect and saying oh yeah I can overcome this it was to me it was um it was sort of demeaning women and also it in one sense it was it was, uh, what's the word I usually say, uh, the, the reality television, it was dumbing down the younger generation. Yeah, for sure. You know? 
I think part of that is liberal feminism, you know, which we're both really alluding to, which is this idea that, you know, we are not a sex class. Mm -hmm. We we uh, we're all individuals and we can just do what we want. And there's nothing. Um, you know, we have not there's not a kind of commonality. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know. Like that's the case with something like, say, Margaret Thatcher. Well, did that help women in, in England? rise up I don't think so I mean I think she just was a female leader now that's not to say that we shouldn't celebrate female leaders like I got into huge trouble <laughs> with a very few people who were very annoyed at me because I said R.I.P. Queen Elizabeth from the Countess Twitter and obviously speaking of female leaders you know you get it from every angle because I you remember do. the first time I went on RT radio uh, I was told oh why did you use the Countess as your figurehead because do you know she shot so-and-so uh, and I, I, I was sorry afterwards, you know, I just said, well, she wasn't an, imper she was an imperfect hero, heroine perhaps. And, you know, you don't have to be a perfect hero. No. But um, she was a role yeah, model. And she I found out afterwards that she hadn't actually shot. It was a complete go to, to your point of whitewashing or erasing women yeah. and the roles in actual revolution. There was also an attempt to smear her. So contemporaneous accounts do not place her there and she couldn't have been there. Uh, so that was completely made up retrospectively to, um, you know, essentially create some bad, a bad news story around her that would attach to her, latch onto her. I don't think it's really worked though. I think she's just largely, some people have an issue with her, but she's, she's, I think, largely kind of adored by the Irish people. And it is that idea of being a female leader. Mm. Now, you don't have to be perfect. You know, yeah. you don't have to be, I think men are judged in a completely different way. Like, I mean, perhaps she wasn't, you know, uh, Earth Mother, but I don't think men are, you know, judged in that way if, if they go on to do the sort of seismic things that she did, you know, being the first ever female minister in a modern day democracy, you know, that was extraordinary. Um, so she is our figurehead. Um, I've absolutely stuck to my, you know, guns for want of a better word. <laughs> oh, it's a minefield. Um, but, you know, so many people have so strong opinions about the logo and the branding. And I just love it. You know? I love it. I, I have one of your T-shirts. Yeah. I mean, just look, look at that beautiful. Um, I'm a really visual person. I'd like to think I'm a creative. And I I just love that calming Art Deco font, you yes. know, and it's kind of of her era as well. Yes. Uh, and I and I and I just think that and that picture of her. So, you know what it's taken from. Everyone knows that famous yeah. photo. But we had an artist who supports us hand draw it. So right. you know, it, is, it is a beautiful piece of art, you know, like yeah. even with branding. Um, and yeah, no, I'm very proud of it. And I think it's good to, like at the beginning, people were saying, oh, just call yourselves Women's Rights Ireland or this or the, that. But like, it's good yeah. to stand out a bit, isn't it? You know? And she was, she is iconic in our Irish history. Yeah. You imagine, know. You know, the, imagine there's like, you know, Connell Bridge and there's, uh, you know, O'Connell Street and there's no... um. There should be a Markovic. There should be. There like should be. A yeah. building or statue or, you know, the spire went up and nobody really knows what it means. You know? <laughs> like that could have been a statue of Countess Markovic, you know. Um, but I'd like to think that she's proud of what we're doing. because Yeah, I think she would be. Like we are ordinary women who've kind of just taken up this fight, really. And when I say fight, like... We're not changed, chained to fences outside the doll. I mean, I do hold little rallies outside the doll and I make speeches, but quite often I'm found inside, you know, inside Leinster House, like assisting legislators. And more and more of them are, hope, you know, I'm happy to say working with us because yeah. that's what we want to do. Like we just want to bring the expertise, you know, as you said at the outside, outside outset, you know, when this was being debated, it's fair to say politicians in this country were being managed. They were being managed. They were only hearing one side. Heartstrings were being pulled. The very well-funded um, trans lobby groups were, were kind of beating a door in. But now I'm beating a door. Beating a door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm in and out quite a lot speaking to different politicians. And that's good. That's the way you have to do this work. That's the way I've approached it. Yeah. You know, just offering that um, expertise because... God knows this is like doing a PhD because it's so, you know, it is uh, fairly esoteric, you know, and you kind of have to grapple with, uh, you know, things as diverse as sports science, endocrinology, 
you know, you probably yeah. need a fair, fairly good, maybe it could be just intuitive, it doesn't have to be theoretic, but, you know, grounding in sort of feminism theory, like just to understand what I just outlined at the beginning, the basics yeah. of why we need single sex provision. But, you know, um, yeah, to your point, I kind of wandered there, but, you know, you were saying about feminism has changed. Like it's certainly changed from second wave to liberal feminism, which is individualism, which says, you know, Kim Kardashian, as long as you're making money, you're empowering yeah. yourself. I think that's true. It doesn't lift other women up at all. And I don't think there's any empowerment in the male gaze. So if you're stripping for a living, you know, I don't see that. How can that be empowering? It can't yeah. be. Um, but equally, I think feminism, and this is what I, I hope we're taking back through our work. So what you were describing is grassroots feminism. Yeah. I think that's really important. Like women, local women doing things locally. Um, and I think feminism has become this really like abstract totally unlatched from anything earthy or real or physical or nature yeah. it became this kind of floating free you know highly academic abstract kind of argument that was just had in academia and I'm yes. not really sure if I'm a fan of that at all because I think no wonder they were able to kind of slide in there and say trans women are women because if everything if nothing is latched onto and grounded in nature yeah the fact that we're the ones who give birth yeah you know it all just floats free and it just becomes I don't know what I'm looking what word I'm looking for but you know it just becomes this kind of untethered um rarefied kind of discourse which has no bearing on the lives of real women and no. totally unrelatable yeah. so like we try and um we get out and about a lot we do info stalls all around Ireland we meet people but also like we'll comment with on things that are happening which aren't necessarily to do with gender ideology but things like you know we did a lot of commentary I, I did a lot of commentary on when that little girl was pushed under the um dart by that kind of group of boys with the state you know the person on yeah. the, the platform just looking on everyone looking on you know or issues like porn we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a lot um male violence against women and girls in general and just generally the lives of women and girls and children in Ireland. But another issue that's important as well, which I think people are starting to really get is the impact this is having on same sex attractive people. So gay, lesbians, bisexuals, because, you know, in the classroom where there's a, a young person saying, oh, I'm trans, they're highly likely to be gay. In fact, you know, higher than 80 percent chance. And so what that means is that we're actually, if you follow the logical con conclusion and that young person takes puberty blockers and then cross sex hormones, they will become um, sterile ultimately. So therefore what we're talking about is, uh, you know, eugenics of gay people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've said that from the beginning and we got a lot of flack for it, but that's, I stand over that. And equally, I stand over the fact that um, a, a, a woman or a girl, obviously mm -hmm. a girl, slicing off healthy functional yeah. is, is is mutilation and it breaches every code of ethics and medicine yes you know where is where is the you know the moral integrity of a doctor taking off the young breasts of a young girl a young woman and also i've heard stories of young young women going in and saying they want a hysterectomy and things like that and i'm going that's unnatural. It's mutilation and it's it's child abuse, you know, in one sense. And I, you're a doc, you're a lawyer and a journalist, and I keep telling everybody there must be do uh, lawyers and barristers waiting in the sidelines, waiting for either even for us speaking out, we'd we'll be uh, labelled far right, which we're not, which is again a label that the, that that the um lobbyists have put on to people who speak up show up speak up and stand up for women's rights it's as if women's rights now has become a dirty word and feminism has become a dirty word and it's taking us women to really stand up and a lot of people are saying it's taking bravery and you got your brave because women have been silenced Mm -hmm. through all this transgender ideology and for me that's really against and feminism is that women are silenced mm -hmm. and that that concerns me and I think again the education the young children 
you know, being indoctrinated about all transgender ideology through education when that's a parent's uh, role. What's your opinions on that? I feel really strongly that, you know, we have to do everything in our power to stop a whole generation being indoctrinated because, yeah. you know, I think they started with prisons on purpose because they kind of took a, um, a, a gamble that society at large wouldn't really care about these women who, after all, are so utterly dehumanized by the time they've got to prison and are incarcerated. They have no voice, they have no agency. They are the, at the very bottom of the heap socially. And so it's like a kind of test ground for them. And, you know, you end up in a situation where in Ireland, um, these men are the in the, the um, sort of balcony above, the landing above, shouting abuse at women, you know, sexualized abuse, these are women who are invariably victims of male violence and male sexual violence themselves. And then, you know, in more extreme cases where they mix with the women, like in Jersey, the, the, the women were handed, and in California, handed condoms before like 100 men were transferred into their facility. Like this stuff is the, it's just like a horror movie. But moving on to schools, like I feel I can draw... A comparison insofar as both audiences are captive audiences. Like a child cannot just go, sorry, no, this is not for me. I'm out of here. They're incredibly malleable. They want to do what their peers are doing. They will completely believe what Miss Murphy is telling them. Um, and now I know we have an opt-out clause, but our position as an organization is that it's just not good enough. No. Teenagers typically don't want to be stigmatized. No. Uh, firstly so they'll beg you not to up them out secondly like clearly children will talk about things in the playground um but also like I feel like schools are really they're 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 at this strange juncture where you know and teachers come to us all the time saying I don't want to transition children I don't want to teach this what do I do and, you know, the Enoch Burke case has had, I think, a chilling effect in classrooms across Ireland. But there is no right in law that you can evoke to have to be known by your preferred pronouns. Um, that is not the case. Gender reassignment is the protected ground. Um, and gender does not include, as things stand, now the government are trying to change this, but as things stand, gender is not, does not include gender identity. There's no right to be called by your preferred pr pronoun. Yeah. Um, obviously no child in Ireland will have a gender recognition certificate as things stand. We had, again, there's, there is a bill in, um, that exists to, to push down self-ID to children um, and to expand it out um, so that gender includes gender identity. If that does happen, by the way, you won't even need to fill out a form. You'll just be able to identify into that lady's changing room, those wow. that are toilets on a whim. And I know this not only because Technically, that's how it would work legally, but also because this is precisely what's happening in California and certain states in Australia, where they embedded it into, in California, their equality legislation, and in Australia and certain states, they embedded it into their pre-existing human rights framework. So there is no filling out of a form, sending it in, getting your certificate. Now in Ireland, that's what happens. But, you know, as you and I both know, there's no gatekeeping. You can be literally in the middle of criminal proceedings for rape and you'll, you'll still be handed that gender recognition certificate. Um, but what was the question again? I'm... <laughs> I, I was just really, what were your thoughts on it? And you, you actually just, you actually answered the, the question. What were your thoughts on all that? So where do we go from now? As you said, because this is only the start of the conversation, because mainstream media will very, very rarely talk about the issue. And if they do, it's the, the, the one sided and it's censored and controlled. So really, we've gone, we're all having to talk outside the mainstream media about this issue and topic. I'd, I'd like to think that will change. I, I've, um, I'm appearing on an RT2 um, documentary tomorrow night. It's right. already up there. Uh, <laughs> It's called Let's Talk About Sex. It's presented by Richie Sadler. And I'm happy to say that initially they said we don't want to go near gender ideology and it was about porn. And, you know, we do do advocacy around porn um, within the same framework, you know, through a kind of feminist framework. And we view it as 
really um, a day it's ch- safeguarding danger to children who are watching it and young people and a danger and a you know an issue for women so that's what I did the interview on and then I just when it was recording um talked about gender ideology and they kept it in I'm happy to say they kept it in and wow. so really now they've cut out bits of it where I'm a bit you know not hardline but I kind of say just because you're accepted there's tolerance to social transition doesn't mean that you can get into the girls toilet room or the girls sports team however they did keep in the bit which is really our position that if it's going to be taught in school and I would say that I don't I think the genie's out of the bottle you know and activists don't want to hear this they don't like me saying I think we should amend not repeal they don't like me saying you know it it needs to be taught in school but it does need to be taught in school because there's probably two children who say they're trans in the classroom you know it's it's we're saturated by the, the culture in the culture by it like it is mainstreamed you know, like porn, it has mainstreamed. So what we need to do is take a step back and criticize it and deconstruct it and analyze it critically. That's yes. the t- that's what we need to do. So yeah. with ideology, gender ideology, obviously we need to look at it from a gender critical point of view, which is the whole premise of what we do in the Countess. Like that's what we offer. We offer that framework. So rather than saying kind of down with this kind of thing, you know, well, what is it? Why is it harmful to the rights of women and girls? Clearly, you know, my view is, and that this would be the general critical view, like up until a moment ago in the culture, everyone agreed that for women and girls to have a life outside the home, they needed certain things like their own sports and their own toilets and change rooms and may, perhaps in some cases their own special lists. Um, so that's why we have things like, you know, um, female-only prizes in literature or whatever, just to try and overcome the structural inequalities and the threat of male violence. Yes. And so if we do away with all those measures, well, we no longer have equality and we've lost all those rights that our foremothers fought for. Some of them died for, you know, we're just going back a hundred years. Yeah. I'm trying to make that argument to make people see that, you know, this is not some sidebar. No. This is a radical reordering of all of society and it impacts every part of society. If your child, like, People in Ireland do not want their daughter tackled by a boy on a rugby pitch or a no. hockey pitch. They don't want their daughter running the gauntlet in mixed sex exchange rooms. They don't want their child told there's hundreds of genders. You can be a boy or girl, neither. <laughs> you it's know, they don't <laughs> And know, it's dangerous. It's hugely yeah. destabilizing. It's a complete attack on the rights of women and children. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an attack on the rights, the hard won rights of gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. Like I don't, I don't, I just, I cannot wait for the moment. And I don't think there's going to be a reckoning as such, but, you know, I think people who were loud on the other side will just kind of pretend they never really were. Yeah. That's going to go. Like, I don't think, I don't think anyone's going to say to me, Alicia, you were so right all along. <laughs> now <laughs> well, I think we will. We will. The women behind you will. <laughs> you know, that would be lovely. <laughs> we will, because we're saying it already. You know, we're saying it already. And, you know, it's we're so grateful that there is women like yourself who have really pushed yourselves out there, which shouldn't have perhaps to been the case in the first place. But through all of what's happened and I don't think it just happened overnight. I think this was a very planned structure and marketed very, very well and strategic campaigns, through, oh, I think, through the years. I totally agree with that. Like when you take a step back and look at how they've done this, how they've run this, how yeah. they've managed to get changes in law in how many different countries yeah. in, in what, 10 years, like it is a masterclass yeah. really in sign yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You it know. definitely was. And I'm conscious you have to go and collect your children like I'm a mother, <laughs> like I'm all mothers. So, but uh, Lisha, I really want to thank you for taking the time to come and speak to Confident Women Ireland because I hope going forward now that you'll be a regular contributor to That's Confident great. Women Ireland and the Irish Political Roundup as well because this conversation is only starting. It's only starting again. And it's only where women now have been silenced in not speaking up against all this. We, we were silenced for the last couple of years. And now it's about time telling women, you know, you don't need to be silenced. Speak up, st- yeah. show up. I've taken, I've taken all the bullets for you. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> 
Leash, you know, it's not as a, it's not as dangerous out there anymore. Like, no, but, you know, I've been, I was doxxed very early on. I've been to the guards. Like, it's it wasn't it was not no. easy. You it's know? not easy. You know, it's like you be cancelled, you be ghosted, you be blacklisted, and everything. And then people just won't even acknowledge you, and then they roll their eyes up and everything else. So, no, thank you so much for. Yeah, there is a there is a price to be paid um, for doing this work, and I think that's. That's why it's important to kind of come together like this. So I'm really yeah. grateful to uh-huh. meet you at this on the in this place and have this lovely chat. And I welcome more of them. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And just before you go, where can people find you, the Countess? Uh, uh, what's your website? I will put everything in the description yeah. box. So just yeah, we're, we're everywhere. We're on. We've had if we've done TikTok videos. I've had 1.7 million views. Wow. Yeah. So I'm on TikTok, so I must get on it now. <laughs> Instagram, uh, YouTube. We were very good at YouTube channel. We've probably got about fifteen hours of footage now on YouTube. Uh, all our media is there, and all our webinars. So, like three years ago, we started doing webinars, talking to experts. So they're all there on kind of mixed sex prisons and International Women's Day and activism and campus ideological culture, like every you know the whole loads of different areas are covered in the, in the webinars. But then all the media we've done since is all there. Then we're on Twitter. We've got a good community on Facebook. What else do I miss? The website, obviously, as well. Uh, the very cluttered website. We've kind of had grown it. <laughs> Any web developers out there who want to come and help us, you're, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, Leisha, thank you so much for taking the time and being such a wonderful, wonderful um, role model in modern day Ireland in 2023. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you, Roisin. Thank you. Bye. Bye.